Okay, so to give you some context of where we are in history, Martin Luther is going to pass his 95 arguments against the Catholic Church, his arguments for reform. He's going to pass those in 1517, so the very beginning of the 16th century. What does that mean to you? Well, we always use Christopher Columbus kind of as our starting point. If Columbus <laughs> sailed the ocean blue in 1492, there, we're in the same generation as the beginning of the exploration period, the age of discovery, where Europe is starting to look at this new continent of North America. So it's coming closer and closer to our own history that you are familiar with. Okay, so I would also remind you that at this particular time, turn of the 16th century, the two big powerhouses, the two empires, the ones that have all the money and have the blessing of the Catholic Church are Spain, right? Uh, we saw how Queen Isabella and King Ferdinand send Columbus off to the New World. Uh, Spain is the powerhouse of Europe, and the second place silver medalist goes to France. They're going to be the two big Catholic kingdoms uh, at this time. Now, Martin Luther is neither French nor Spanish. He lives in one of these German principalities, a, a small monarchy uh, in Wittenberg. Okay, Wittenberg is uh, a town in Germany now, but it's a principality You know, a lot of city-states over 300 different kingdoms in what today we would call Germany. And we, when we get to World War I, we'll look at how there were efforts to unify Germany into a single nation state. But at this time, lots of different kingdoms. So Martin Luther, 1517, is a monk. He's a priest. He grew up Catholic. In fact, he's a devout, devout Catholic. And, um, you know, he practices celibacy. He's, he... Uh, uh, is not just somebody observing from the outside, but he is an inside observer to what he sees as hypocrisy. I'm just trying to use that as our frame of reference here. The church at the time is acting in a way that he feels does not fit with the message of the Bible. You know, the teachings of Jesus being the foundation of the Christian church. Martin Luther is looking at what the church is doing and saying, geez, I'm not so sure that this is exactly what Jesus had in mind uh, when he came down and was doing his mission. Okay, so let's. what I intend to do today is to look at several of Luther's complaints because those complaints are going to shape a new kind of church, one that's closer to the people. Okay, last week we talked about the sale of forgiveness of sins. Right. What is the term? Give me a thumbs up. Don't say it out loud. But if you remember the term for the sale of uh, forgiveness of sin, wealthy people could buy their way into heaven, according to the Catholic Church, through the purchase of what? Thumbs up if you know. Thumbs down if you don't. What's the term for the purchase of forgiveness? You could buy it for yourself. You could buy it for your family members. Joiner, what is it? Uh you know, I knew it two periods ago, and I still do. It's I know what you're talking about, but the word is like pleasantries or something. Oh, here, close. It starts with an I. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> give me a second. Yeah, it sounds kind of, kind of like pleasantries, or it, it, you might think that. Yeah. <laughs> if I'm, I'm if I'm going to you. give you what you want, I am going to indulge you. There we go. Indulgences. Yeah. You remember talking about indulgences? Okay. So today, you might think that the church would take care of the most needy people, right? That the whole mission of the church is to take care of people that are struggling, that are hurting, that need God, that the doors of the church would be open. Well, Martin Luther nails this list of complaints onto the Wittenberg Cathedral as a symbol of the fact that this church does not represent the mission of, of Jesus. Number one, it's selling the forgiveness of sins at a high price to wealthy people. In addition to that, only the wealthiest who can afford it can get baptized. They can go in and they can take communion. Not everybody can go in and get communion. Um, so today, you know, if you're a member of a church, usually you can get those sacraments. 
At this particular time, the priests had total control over who they gave the sacraments to, and they weren't going out to the peasants. They weren't allowing peasants to come in, yet the church was taking large amounts of money from the people to build these beautiful cathedrals and to rub elbows with the most powerful individuals in Europe. Okay, There's other examples of uh, what Luther identified as corrupt behavior didn't seem like it was based in the Bible or based in the teachings of Jesus. Uh, one of the things that's big with Catholic tradition is the worship or reverence of saints. Okay, We've talked about martyrdom and how Christian martyrs oftentimes were elevated to sainthood. And the Catholic Church believed that really there are only a few channels to God. Okay. The priest has a channel to God. The Pope has a channel to God. So the clergy has a channel to God. If you want to get to God, you got to go through them. So confession is a big part of the Catholic tradition. If you want forgiveness, you have to confess to somebody that has God's ear. But the worship of saints, nothing in the Bible identifies this as a practice, but the, Christ, the Catholic Church starts to create this kind of uh, group of saints that can go to God and protest to God on your behalf for different circumstances. Most importantly, uh, Jesus's mother, the Virgin Mary. And this is another example of what um, Luther sees as more of the um, culture of Catholicism as opposed to the actual Christian practice. Okay. Another thing. Now, guys, I am with this lecture, I'm identifying a bunch of stuff that's not written on the board. So this is your one and only chance to hear this, as opposed to mindlessly writing down what's up here. Listen to what I'm saying and be sure you add these in. Okay, so the sale of indulgences, control over uh, different sacraments, taking tax money, taking money from the people, yet denying access to the sacraments to the average poor person, the worship of the saints or this large uh, collection of saints that became important in Catholic culture. The other thing was the church believed the only person pious enough to read the Bible was a priest and that the Bible had to be published in Latin, the original transcribed language of that document. Okay. Now, here's a pop quiz. Okay. Last week, we were looking at famous Renaissance individuals, and we had several projects about a publisher, a printer who develops a printing press that allows for the creation of large amounts of text in a pretty short amount of time. He was also a German. What was this German's name who created a printing press? Give me a thumbs up if you know, thumbs down if you don't. This is my way of seeing, you know, are you retaining the stuff we've covered? I won't call on it, you if you put your thumb down, but if you know, thumb up, thumb down if you don't. Kind of maybe don't call on me sort of thing. All right. Who is it? It was uh, Johan, uh, Johannes, Johan, something like that. Johannes yeah. Gutenberg, right? And he's right back there on the wall. Johannes Gutenberg creates the printing press. It should be no surprise, this is not a coincidence that these two Germans, Luther and Gutenberg, are in this revolution to try to bring access to the Bible closer to the German people. You should, first of all, you can't get in to the cathedral unless you're somebody. Second of all, you can't read the Bible unless you're somebody that's learned and has access to Latin and you're a priest. How are you going to get closer to God if that document is inaccessible. And so Luther wants to open up access to that by being allowed to print the Bible in whatever language is spoken in the local community. Now, what do you call somebody that goes against the rules of the church, that defies the rules of the church? A heretic. You can see that Luther is on a fast path to heresy. Okay. He wasn't the first person to criticize the church, but he is kind of the first person to, to get this large following of influential supporters. 
Now, as I have already pointed out, France and Spain are the big kingdoms, the big Catholic kingdoms. These German princes, kind of small potatoes in the Catholic world. But there are enough German princes that latch on to Luther's message that he's got a powerful support system. Okay? Well, Luther is going to be excommunicated from the Catholic Church. He gets called up by the local cardinal and prosecuted, put on, put on trial and excommunicated for all of these criticisms. Now, this particular page, I'm going to stop right here for a second. I'm going to stop talking. Um, but this particular page really deals with what I've already covered, the big criticisms of the Catholic Church. For example, uh, celibacy. Nothing in the Bible says that people who follow Jesus, men who were, that preach the word of God, have to be celibate. Yet, that's something the Catholic Church insisted upon. But what was ironic to Luther is that the current pope, before he was pope, fathered four or five kids. Okay, So he was playing the field when he was a priest and then was insisting upon priestly celibacy once he became pope. That's hypocrisy, right? And I think Luther says something that this guy has had more children than converts. You know, more people, he's had more babies than he has believers. Uh, and so calling him out, right? Given the truth brew or the scandal broth or the tea um, <laughs> on, the, on the pope. Any questions about these criticisms? Now, while people finish writing this up, this is what I want to hear from you. If you've been to different denominations, if you've been to a Catholic church or you've been to a Protestant church, what are the differences you see amongst those churches? Any observations? Yeah. So when I went to one my friends, like... At my church, everyone can take communion, but at a Catholic church, you can't take communion while you're Catholic. Right. And, like, it's, like, way more serious than my church was. Like, we sing at my church, and we sing, and we sit in pews, and we look at my church, we just sing. Right. Okay, so the Catholic church, being the oldest Christian church, is very proud of tradition, structure, and... Um, Oh, let's say uh, the culture of the church. And one of the things, one of the standards the Catholic Church insists upon is that in order to receive the sacraments that you are Catholic. They won't marry you unless you're Catholic. They won't give you communion unless you're Catholic. You can't be baptized in the Catholic Church unless you're Catholic. Um, other denominations are, have a bit more open doors, right? Uh, if you are visiting a Methodist church, you can go up and take communion if you want to do that. So that's a good example. Um, the other thing you're bringing up about seriousness. So Catholicism is really about order and routine and um, uh, tradition, where many denominations are focused on emotional experience. Okay. Now, the concern about having a good experience in church is still several hundred years away. The first great awakening where people are like, you know what? I would like to feel something when I go to church. The Puritans are going to be involved with that. And their thought is, oh, well, we can make you feel something. We'll make you feel very afraid. And so they start preaching hellfire and damnation and that kind of thing that really is soul shaking. And it won't be until the 19th century that people start saying, you know what? God is pretty chill. Actually, he's not so angry. He's not going to smite you for every small thing. Actually, he's pretty loving. And that's a second great awakening. But that's early 1800s. That's less than 200, or 200 years ago in some regards. So that's relatively new. At this time, you showed up, you did as you were told, and it didn't matter if you felt anything or not. That was your obligation to both the church and the state. Right? That was the law. Okay. Good examples. Okay? Those are things Luther is trying to move away from. Okay. Let's move on then. So, 
So, um, one of the things Luther supports is this idea that you do not need a priest to get you into heaven, right? That you don't need to ask for forgiveness from a priest, that your relationship is between you and God, and that a person can, can perhaps access, um, get to heaven through their own good works or their own good faith. The one thing I want you to take away from this slide is his argument is called the 95 Theses. Not theses, that's something else, okay? Theses is plural for thesis. What is a thesis? It's, it's, it's an argumentative statement, right? It's, a, it's an argument. 95 arguments for reform. One of those is that it's hogwash that uh, priests have to be celibate. One of the first things Luther does after he creates the, his own separate church is he gets married. I'm not sure that's the most important takeaway. Okay. We can move, we can come back to this slide, but I want to give you my con the conclusion. Now, throughout our study of the Middle Ages, we know the one thing that unifies kingdoms is their connection to the Catholic Church. So when Lutheranism starts popping up in Germany, you can guarantee that Catholic neighbors in France and Spain were not happy about it. Okay? No longer are they going to war with Muslims over the Holy Land in the Crusades, but that didn't prevent them from going to war over religious views and, and power and control. So, King Charles V of Spain is the most powerful Catholic king of the time, starts going to war against these German princes. Now, Luther had escaped execution. When he was excommunicated, he was not executed thanks to wealthy and influential friends who helped buy his freedom. But almost immediately, the Catholic Church was ready to put Martin Luther's head on a stake. And so um, for a couple of decades, Spain and Germany are fighting back and forth, trying to get rid of Lutheranism. Um, this all comes to an end when Spain goes to war with France. Okay, Francis I, if you're ever wondering why France is called France and not uh, Franks, Francis. Okay. France is going to uh, be developing into its modern nation state. Anybody in here play the game nation states? And we need to talk about that game because I, I see future lesson plans with this as we start to focus on not so much on religion, but political control of a boundary, a border. We're starting to de develop tradi or traditional nation states. France and Spain go into a larger conflict, and in order to end conflict with Germany, these two Catholic countries issue an important treaty, the Treaty of Augsburg. Okay, we want to be sure we understand what the Treaty of Augsburg does. And if you're ever touring colleges and you see Augsburg College, or you're going through a community out in the Midwest that's named Augsburg, okay, or you go past a church, that's the Augsburg Church. I guarantee you it has Lutheran roots, okay? Because the, the Treaty of Augsburg gives the first Protestant group their religious rights. It's basically the Catholic Church saying Lutherans in Germany have a right to exist. Hooray, I have a right to exist. It says that German princes have the right to decide what their country's religion is. Not that the individual, not a person, you as an individual have no right to decide what your faith is. Your king or prince will decide that for you. Okay? But we now have three, we have three Christian sects. <coughs> Catholicism, uh, Eastern Orthodox Christianity, and Lutheranism. Okay. Lutheranism is the first of the Protestant denominations. 
those denominations that come out of protesting the way that things were with the traditional Catholic Church. So moving into tomorrow, this is my last statement. Moving into tomorrow, we're going to be looking at the English Reformation. So the Protestant Reformation starts with Martin Luther and high ideals. These ideas that God, that they should move God closer to the people, the churches shouldn't be so corrupt and controlled by priests, that some of the rules that are made just don't make sense. Okay, those are kind of high ideals. The English Reformation is going to be about Henry VIII being able to get divorced and him having power and control over everything. Not such high ideals. Okay, him being able to marry whoever he wants and being the head of the church. Henry VIII and his, his reign is pretty corrupt. Okay, so corrupt that Christian radicals are going to say, hey, Slow down. We need to purify the church. That's going to give rise to the Puritans, the same group of people that come to North America and settle as pilgrims in Massachusetts. Okay? So I'm trying to make this connect. I'm trying to make this relevant to the history you know, to the world, the, the country that you live in. Any questions? Okay. That's it for the day.